everyone, and welcome to a new podcast from Wake Up Theater. Today we'll chat with Bogdan Tabakaru, an experienced actor and director who has brought a number of very successful plays to the stage here in Munich, such as Anton Chekhov's The Seagull and Ken Ludwig's Lend Me a Tenor. Today he will talk to us about what he's learned from acting and directing and how it has enriched his life. With that, let's get started. So, good afternoon, Bogdan. Well, you know, it's been so great to have been working with you on, on so many theater projects over the past several years. And <clears throat> just by way of saying hello and everything, I just want, want you to know that you've been one of the real key foundations uh, in, in my personal journey to getting on the theater stage and all that's meant for me in my life. So... Thanks so much for taking the time to chat today and share your experience of becoming a successful actor and director. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to spend the time on this platform with you as well. Okay. So, you know, as they say, begin at the beginning. And I guess your beginning is um, in Romania. Uh, and in fact, when uh, Nicola Strachesco was still in power, Maybe you could just say a little bit about your early life and what impact those times under communist rule had on your childhood, even though I guess it was only about three years after you were born that he went out of power, right? Right. Uh, actually, even less than that. I was born in 88. And the fall came in 89. I think I lived one Christmas under Joshua School, so can't can't really say that I remember much, but uh, my parents like to tell the stories. Uh, with all the fun hassles of not having a throwaway diapers, for example, like, uh, oh, I remember a lot of crying and I remember a lot of uh, me being little and my parents going, oh God, we have to wash diapers again. <laughs> That's kind of like what I remember, you know? My mom loves to tell the story that the first couple, first months, so up until I got out of diapers, they would have to switch living so they lived in a three-room apartment and they would have to sleep in different rooms depending on which room was occupied with drying out uh, diapers. <laughs> and obviously in the winter, because I was born in February, um, you, you had to keep the windows open so that they can, so that the room breathes. Otherwise they would have mold and stuff like that. But it, it, you should come, you should come to our family Christmas or Easter events one time. So um, I, I understand that you got involved uh, even in children's theater at a very young age, like four or five years old. Was that just something that kids did or was it something your parents encouraged you or how did that happen? It was definitely not something my parents encouraged me to do, but it was something that was proper at the time, right? You can imagine just a couple of years after the fall of communism, like things have changed, but some things take some time to change. So this was the time when I was in kindergarten and it was expected and proper that every kid get a proper education. So we would start in kindergarten with, with different languages, like we had English, French, uh, basics of conversation, numbers, stuff like that. Just hello, thank you, nothing complicated. And part of that was also learning to recite poems in a proper and a clear way, proper poise on the stage, but don't fidget, don't do this, don't do that, don't uh, pick your nose or other things that I remember I used to do <laughs> at that age. So yeah. But it was like every year in kindergarten, we had like at least one something put on stage and where everyone was expected to perform something like recite poems, sing songs and dance. Those are the three big things. Yeah. And you said you recited poetry? Well, at four, I, it's, it's a very high poet, <laughs> very high child related poetry. I had to say a poem it's about a little boy and his handkerchief. <laughs> So it goes, Batista me mica, she nasu yu mititel, vreau sa fiu copil cu mintes, sa am grijă de el, nu vreau ca lumea sa zica, uite-l pe murdarel, vreau ca lumea sa zica, uite-l pe curatel, something like that. Well, I can hear the, the, the rhythm and the, and the rhyme, so good job. So, so what does it mean? I guess roughly translated means my handkerchief is small and my nose is tiny. I want to be a good boy and take care of it. I don't want people to say, look at the dirty boy. I want people to say, look at the clean boy. So like, 
<laughs> quality poetry right there. Oh, that's ins that's inspiring. I can tell that got you started on the right track. Shakespeare, please. That's <laughs> so. You said that that there was a lot of focus on on learning language as well, but I think I remember you telling me that you learn English more from watching cartoons than anything you learned in class. That's kind of fascinating. Say a little bit about that. I think that's true. I have, yeah, I think I have a better year than I have patience to sit down and study. That's for sure. Now in school, we did a lot of grammar and grammar rules and do this and where to I before E, but not after C kind of things. What we didn't do a lot in school is learn to talk and practice speaking and do We did, did a lot of scholarship work. Like you sit down, you translate, you learn some rules, you apply them. It's very boring for me. And at the time I, again, post-communist, we didn't have much Car uh, pr many programs for kids growing up or watching TV. Uh, but we did have one thing from, I think, from the UK at the time. It was the Cartoon Network and the Discovery Channel. And those weren't translated so in or had subtitles. So I would just spend, I think, eight, eight hours per day, every day during my summer holidays in between uh, school years. Uh, just watching the Cartoon Network, watching the same cartoons, more or less the same Tom and Jerry episodes, but also Looney Tunes and what was it? Uh, uh, Droopy was on and stuff. So stuff from the 50s, 60s, really, from the US. Just over and over and over. I had no idea what they were talking about, but I could recite them like my previous poetry slam. <laughs> <laughs> so by the time I got into school and we started putting translations to the words i was like oh that's what it means everything just kind of exploded in in meaning so your your education was from looney tunes huh oh my goodness more material for jokes it probably explains some of the pictures i have of you where you 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 make the best faces of just about anybody i know i mean i go back and forth from being daffy duck to bugs bunny and and i i want to be bugs bunny by but, but i end up being daffy duck in terms of behavior <laughs> <laughs> so what was the motivation then to come to to germany and to get started on a very professional path in technology and obviously learning uh, a little more English than what you learned on Looney Tunes. I did learn a lot of uh, German English. I want to say that I had a very clear path that I knew I was going to move to Germany at one point and this was all, I don't know, something I was working up towards. But to be honest, it was more of a, mostly it was a lot of luck and I think just a spur of the moment thing. I didn't plan to leave Romania, although I was at the point of my time where I was like looking, where's where where do I belong in this world? It's it's I finished my studies, I I started working as an engineer, I got a job, and like okay, it's time to set roots somewhere and become my own man, right? Leave my parents' home and stuff like that. But for whatever reason, this was to back in 2011. No, this was back in 2013, actually. I started working in 2011 as a, as a student, and I finished in 2013 my studies. And it turned out that the company was really happy with me, and I was really happy with the company, and we just couldn't wait for us to start working together. <laughs> then I got the message that they are not hiring anyone because of the economic crisis, which was already four years old and mainly non-existent anymore. But for whatever reason, the company says, we're not hiring, so sorry, we can't keep you. So I was left with a kind of a bit of a early life crisis. Like, what am I going to do now? One thing led to another. And I just, within the company, I met a person, one of my bosses from Germany. They they came over to Bucharest where we had our, uh, our uh, offices. We went out for a beer and we were talking about perspectives and future and whatnot. And I said, and he asked me, what do I want to do with my life? And I said, I really want to do a PhD. I want to get a doctorate. I don't know. I was at the time I was stargazed and, and, and awestruck by the by the wizards type characters in Harry Potter and the Lord of the Rings and stuff like that. And like those highly educated, very smart people you go to for advice when everything else is gone and who live in an ivory tower somewhere. And I was like, yeah, I want to be a scientist and I want to do a PhD. Out of nowhere, the guy goes like, well, I have a position open if you're interested, but it's in Germany. <laughs> and I said, tell me more, please. <laughs> 
<laughs> so so we went through the proper channels. I applied. They had some competition. I, I, I managed to get the role somehow as if it were an acting job. I managed to get the job. I told my parents and I didn't think in a thousand years that they would let me even for a split second entertain the thought of leaving the house and not spending, not living with them until the end of time. On the span of two months, I was already already on a flight to Germany. Well, you know, it all sounds so serious and focused. And yeah, I just love the picture of you at the graduation party after you got your PhD and face your face is still the Looney Tune face. I, I just love it. <laughs> you know, you do so many really significant things and make such a big contribution. And yet underneath there's still this this just radiant joy in being alive. So congratulations. That's, you know, that's no small accomplishment. Well, thank you so much. I know what you're, I know what you mean. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah. And I, I really have learned to appreciate the term ignorance is bliss. For sure. I mean, you look at, you watch Hollywood movies, you watch great television and great cinema and you go like, can do that? That looks easy. How hard can it be? <laughs> you know how badly do you want to know right <laughs> well it hits you pretty quickly pretty hard i i've i've come to realize you've had a chance to be in a in a number of of acting roles maybe you could just talk about some of the stages or milestones or whatever as you recall them now uh what kinds of things you had to deal with in becoming the authentic believable character in a play that you are now I think it goes back to what I said before, which is cut yourself some slack and don't worry too much about it. And so to some extent, just do, if that makes any sense. Because the opposite of that for me, when I go on stage, as a child, I didn't care that much. I was just, I wasn't really aware of what is happening. I knew I had, okay, this is my cue, go in, do your text and sit down. To some extent, I, th I feel looking back, that was the most the simplest form of acting that I've experienced. And ever since then, ever since puberty, I, I didn't have that feeling anymore up until recently. In this span of time between puberty and recently, I've always had the impression that, oh, I have to prove something that, oh, now it's my cue that I have to do something. I need to perform something because if I don't, then, then, then I'm not taking it seriously, you know? Whereas if I look back uh, and, and what I've learned since then, it's just, Cut yourself some slack and just go with it more. Because to uh, for for the most of it, it is you 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 get up, say your text, and sit down or whatever, cue talk exit. There's more to it than that, of course. But at its simplest form, that's that's basically the framework. And if you can live within that space and allow it to be without trying to control, without the need to perform or to do more than that, then then you're great and. I found that my engineering education has taught me to always be skeptical of such things. And I always was questioning whether should I do more, that I did enough. There was a, there was a lot of internal turmoil to, to figure out, to judge myself and my performance, whether it was good enough or not. And only recently have I figured out, hey, actually, that maybe I can try to tone that voice down because it, more often than not, it causes more harm than it helps. Yeah, it sounds easy to when, when you just say it, but doing it is a is a real challenge, isn't it? I'm proud to say that as much as I try to do it by myself, it's uh, it comes with having a mentor or more, uh, and and people who know how to guide are is very helpful. And I'm proud of myself for saying, hey, you know what? I I I do want help in the form of acting coaching, in the form of therapy. Uh, and the form of becoming a better person, just to help me kind of tap more into the vulnerable, authentic part of me that goes with the flow, as opposed to the control freak that I more often than not am. Well, you're fairly well known in the amateur acting community here in Munich, at least, as being a, a real advocate of the acting techniques that were advocated, developed by Sanford Meisner. Obviously, <laughs> you're not going to do your whole seminar here, but what would you say are the two or three really key points in your 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 understanding of the strengths of his techniques? I find that there's no better way to explain it than Sanford Meisner has done it himself. Let's say it's equal parts 
coming in with 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 a willingness to work and to be vulnerable, whether we do rehearsals or or whether it's a performance or or whether we're it's just a workshop. I try more and more and more actually to to apply these rules in my everyday life whenever possible and whenever it fits. It doesn't always fit, of course, but whenever I can try to leave live by these guiding principles. But just focus is an important topic. Just be focused, be there, be present. I tend to doze off or just daydream or my mind wanders quite quickly, quite often. So being focused is a is an important thing. Definitely listening. And then the other big thing is this curiosity, um, or I think if I remember correctly, Meissner calls it this um, ability to play, this, this curiosity, this interest of a, of a child. So not being childish, but being childlike. I think those big, oh, big eyes, wide open eyes, just wanting to explore and being curious about things and, and in a playful way of exploration and discovery. That is something that, for me, being very self-critical and, of my, and, and critical of others, switching from judgment to playfulness and just celebrating failure and allowing that to happen in a safe environment is, is pivotal whenever I run workshops or rehearsals and whenever we prepare for a performance. That's a, that's a wonderful phrase you just used, celebrating failure. Failure is only a stepping stone to realizing where you've got to work harder on something and how you can get better. It does definitely sound very easy put like that, yes. Emotions that come in the way to kind of derail that process. So after you were in a, a number of successful plays, you made the switch to trying your hand at being a director. I, you know, I'm sure that that has to see what's going on on the stage from a, from a different perspective. And yet I would imagine at the same time, that's helped you to understand more about your own acting experience. Uh, very much so. It's only after making the switch did I start to understand more profoundly what it means to be an actor. Well, I guess let's start. Let's start by uh, let me be truthful and not try to sugarcoat it. I I stepped into directing because I felt that the actor in me wasn't ha- treated properly. And I know how that sounds, and I'm not proud of it, but it is reality and something that I've learned now to understand and to appreciate and to work within myself. Uh, being a drama queen is not nice. And, and realizing that I was one was very, very humiliating and at the same time humbling because I, I never wanted to be a drama queen, but I did find myself being one and I wasn't happy. This only happened much later, this realization. But up until the realization happened, I went like, oh, these directors, they have no idea what they're doing. And I feel frustrated in my character. <laughs> and I was like, I'll show them. I'll be better. <laughs> I won't make the same mistakes. So it was harder than you, harder than you thought, huh? Well, when you fall, you fall. <sighs> Thank God the ground is there to break your fall, right? Looking back, I think going to international competitions, winning, winning prizes, doing what we've done, I'm... I can't really say that I failed in directing, but looking back, I failed in being a perfectionist. I could have done this better. I could have done that better. I could have handled specific conflicts better. But what I do take back from my directing experience is A, learning to talk to people, but more than that, learning to listen. So we slowly get into the Meissner, uh, let's say, dictants. So listening was important and not listening and waiting for my turn to speak, but listening and understanding where, what is it that people actually mean and want to say. In fact, that more, more often than not, we use words and words come out of our mouths, but what we meant to say, mean to say is something different. And having that ability to take a step back and go like, but what do you actually mean helps a lot. Or just a simple question of a child, uh, why? This helps so much in just figuring out where is the person coming from. And most often, more often than not, I've found that actors are dealing with uncertainty in the form of insecurity, of fear, of un- unclarity and whatever, whether because of me or because of other factors. And I very quickly realized that my job as a director is not only to do what the, we typically know a director does, but to also provide that blanket of safety and security in some sort 
that allows the actors and everyone in the production, but every department, sounds, lights, music, costumes, everyone, just to have a feeling that they belong, that, that, that they contribute, that we know what we're doing. And when we don't know, to also have the courage to say, to admit that we don't know and we'll figure it out. So you're going to be leading an acting workshop uh, in uh, about a month or so. What, what would you say aspiring actors who would participate? What, what could they expect to learn from the time that they'll spend with you? Maybe learn a little bit about themselves. Maybe learn a little bit about the craft. What I definitely know uh, that will happen is we will spend some time together and we will get to know each other. And I'm really looking forward to that because... For me, like everyone goes into acting for their own reasons. And for me, the, the, the most important reason, and it took me 10 years to figure that out and, and to embrace it as well, just to accept that this is the reason and just to, to embrace it. And it's such a silly little thing that if I tell you, you'd go like, huh, how's that important? But it is important to me. And that is connection, just being connected with others, being there fully present, vulnerable, willing to go through the process, willing to go to do the work. And knowing that there will be other people around me who are just as curious and eager as, as I am, if not even more. Sounds like good lessons for being alive. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, that's where we'll put. So, Bogdan, we're just about out of time for this podcast. Any last thoughts you'd like to share before we say goodbye? I really had a good time. I was a bit anxious about the podcast because you go, oh, am I going to say, am I going to say something stupid? So you see, my insecurities are always with me, but it was, it was a lovely time to spend and it was lovely to be with you and to, to chat about it. And... Thank you very much, Bogdan. And uh, I'm sure that, uh, you know, the pictures you've shared, particularly from your younger years that the listeners are being able to see as we're doing this uh, will illustrate that very well. Thank you. And uh, looking forward to seeing you at the, at the workshop at uh, the end of April. See you soon. Yeah, thank you so much. And see you then. Have a good one. Ciao. Well, that's it for today. Bogdan will be leading an acting workshop on Sanford Meisner's acting methods at the end of April. For more information, please visit our webpage by clicking on the link provided in the text below. Comments and suggestions are always welcome. And please like our webpage to be informed of future podcasts, workshops, and other theater activities. Have a great day and evening, and until next time. Mm-hmm.